The great fish moved silently through the night water, propelled by short sweeps of its crescent tail. The mouth was open just enough to permit a rush of water over the gills. There was little other motion, an occasional correction of the apparently aimless course by the slight raising or lowering of a pectoral fin, as a bird changes direction by dipping one wing and lifting the other. The eyes were sightless in the black, and the other senses transmitted nothing extraordinary to the small, primitive brain. The land seemed almost as dark as the water, for there was no moon. All that separated sea from shore was a long, straight stretch of beach, so white that it shone. From a house behind the grass-splotched dunes, lights cast yellow glimmers on the sand. The front door to the house opened and a man and a woman stepped out onto the wooden porch. They stood for a moment, staring at the sea, embraced quickly, and scampered down the few steps onto the sand. The man was drunk, and he stumbled on the bottom step. The woman laughed and took his hand, and together they ran to the beach. First, a swim, said the woman, to clear your head. Oh, forget my head, said the man, giggling. He fell backward onto the sand, pulling the woman down with him. Afterward, the man lay back and closed his eyes, and the woman looked at him and smiled. Now, how about that swim, hmm? she said. You go ahead, I'll wait for you here. The woman rose and walked to where the gentle surf washed over her ankles. The water was colder than the night air, for it was only mid-June. She called back, Are you sure you don't want to come? But there was no answer from the sleeping man. She backed up a few steps and then ran at the water. At first her strides were long and graceful, but then a small wave crashed into her knees. She faltered, regained her footing, and flung herself over the next waist-high wave and began to swim. A hundred yards offshore, the fish sensed a change in the sea's rhythm. It did not see the woman, nor yet did it smell her. Running within the length of its body were a series of thin canals dotted with nerve endings which detected vibrations that signaled the brain. The fish turned towards shore. The woman continued to swim away from the beach, stopping now and then to check her position by the lights from the shining house. The tide was slack, but she was tiring, so rested for a moment, treading water. The vibrations were stronger now, and the fish recognized prey. The sweeps of its tail quickened, thrusting the giant body forward with a speed that agitated the tiny phosphorescent animals in the water and caused them to glow, casting a mantle of sparks over the fish. The fish closed on the woman and hurtled past, a dozen feet to the side and six feet below the surface. The woman felt only a wave of pressure that seemed to lift her up in the water and ease her down again. She stopped swimming and held her breath. The fish smelled her now, and the vibrations, erratic and sharp, signaled distress. The fish began to circle close to the surface. Its dorsal fin broke water and its tail thrashing back and forth, cut the glassy surface with a hiss. For the first time, the woman felt fear, though she did not know why. Adrenaline shot through her, urging her to swim faster. She guessed that she was 50 yards from shore. She could see the lights in the house, and for a comforting moment, she thought that she saw someone pass by one of the windows. The fish turned suddenly dropped below the surface, and with two quick thrusts of its tail, was upon her. At first, 
The woman thought she had snagged her leg on a rock or a piece of floating wood. There was no initial pain, only one violent tug on her right leg. She reached down to touch her foot, feeling in the blackness with her left hand, and was overcome by a rush of nausea and dizziness. Her groping fingers found a nub of bone and tattered flesh. She knew that the warm, pulsing flow over her fingers and the chill water was her own blood. The woman threw her head back and screamed a guttural cry of terror. Now the fish turned again, homing on the stream of blood flushing from the woman's femoral artery. This time it attacked from below, hurtling up under the woman, jaws agape. The great conical head struck her like a locomotive. And with the woman's body in its mouth, the fish smashed down on the water with a thunderous splash, spewing foam and blood and phosphorescence in a gaudy shower. On the beach, the man awoke, shivering in the early morning cold. His mouth was sticky and dry. The sun had not yet risen, but a line of pink on the eastern horizon told him that daybreak was near. He stood and began to dress, annoyed that the woman had not woken him when she went back to the house, and he found it curious that she left her clothes on the beach. Back at the house, the door to the room he shared with her was open, and a bedside light was on. Both beds were made. He tossed the woman's clothes on one of the beds and then returned to the living room. Both couches were empty. Only then did he permit his mind to consider the possibility of an accident. Very quickly, the possibility became a certainty. He stole into the host's bedroom. Jack! It's me, Tom. Have you seen Chrissy? Chrissy? Well, she's with you. No, she isn't. I mean, I can't find her. Jack sat up and turned on the light. Jesus Christ, it's five in the morning. You can't find your date? I know. I'm sorry. I think we may have a problem. But when did you see her last? On the beach? Then I fell asleep. I found her clothes. Maybe she drowned. Jack looked at him and then glanced at his watch. I don't know what time the police in this town go to work, he said, but I guess this is as good a time as any to find out. Patrolman Len Hendricks was sitting at his desk in the Amity police station, reading a detective novel, when the phone rang. Amity police, Patrolman Hendricks, he said. Can I help you? This is Jack Foote, over on Old Mill Road. I want to report a missing person. One of my house guests went for a swim at about one this morning, and she hasn't come back yet. Her date found her clothes on the beach. Hendricks began to scribble on a pad. What was the person's name? Uh, Christine Watkins. Age? Uh, say around 25. Okay, Mr. Foote, we'll get on to it. Hendricks hung up the phone and thought, for all anybody knew, the woman was with some guy she met on the beach. On the other hand, if she was washed up somewhere, Chief Brody would want the whole thing taken care of before the body was found by some nanny with a couple of young kids, and it became a public nuisance. Hendricks dialed Chief Brody's home number. Brody rolled over and picked up the receiver. Yeah. Hey, Chief, this is Hendricks. I hate to bother you this early, but... Leonard, this had better be good. I think we got a floater on our hands, Chief. A floater? What in Christ's name is a floater? It was a word Hendricks had picked up from his nighttime reading. A, a drowning, he said, embarrassed. I didn't know if you'd want to check it out before people start swimming. Brody heaved an exaggerated sigh. Okay, Leonard, I'll take a look on my way in, just to make sure your floater isn't cluttering up someone's beach. See you later. It was nearly 
when Brody turned onto the old mill road. The sun was well up. The sky was cloudless. Every hundred yards or so he stopped the squad car and surveyed the beach. There was no sign of a body. He drove on to the station house. Hendricks was finishing up his paperwork when Brody walked in and looked disappointed that Brody wasn't dragging a corpse behind him. No luck, Chief? That depends on what you mean by luck, Leonard. If you mean, did I find a body, and if I didn't, isn't it too bad? The answer to both questions is no. Brody poured himself a cup of coffee and began to flip through the morning papers. When the day shift appeared at eight, Hendricks was finishing up as Brody came out of his office. I'm going out to see Foot, Leonard. You want to come along? I thought you might want to follow up on your floater. Brody smiled. Oh, sure, said Hendricks. I got nothing else going today. They drove out in Brody's car. The young man, Tom Cassidy, met them at the door. It took less than five minutes for Brody to learn everything he needed to know. Mr. Cassidy, he said, I don't mean to sound flip or anything, but has Miss Watkins got a habit of doing strange things? I mean, like taking off in the middle of the night or walking around naked? Not that I know of, said Cassidy, but I really don't know her too well. Oh, I see. Then I guess we'd better go down to the beach again. The three men walked down to the beach. Leonard, you go east, Brody said to Hendricks. We'll go west. You got your whistle? I got it. Chief, you care if I take my shoes off? I don't care, said Brody. Technically, you're off duty. You can take your pants off if you want. Of course, then I'll arrest you for indecent exposure. Hendricks started eastward walking with his head down, looking at the tiny shells and tangles of seaweed. A few bugs skittered out of his path. Every now and then, he looked up to see if Brody and Cassidy had found anything. They were about half a mile away, when he saw a clump of weed and kelp that seemed unusually large. When he reached it, Hendricks bent down to pull some of the weed away. For a few seconds... He stared, frozen, rigid. He, he fumbled in his pocket for his whistle, put it to his lips, and tried to blow. He vomited, staggered back, and fell to his knees. Wait, said Brody, stopping. I think that was a whistle. Come on. Hendricks was still on his knees when they got to him. Mr. Cassidy? Stay back there, will you? said Brody. He pulled apart some of the weeds, and when he saw what was inside, he felt bile rise in his throat. You might as well look now, Mr. Cassidy, and tell me if it's her or not. That? Cassidy said, pointing at the weed. What do you mean? It's her. Brody was still fighting to control his stomach. I think, he said, that it may be part of her. Cassidy shuffled forward. Oh, my God. He put a hand to his mouth. Is it her? Cassidy nodded. What happened to her? I can't be sure, said Brody. Offhand, I'd say she was attacked by a shark. By 11 o'clock, Brody was back in his office, filling out forms about the accident when the phone rang. Carl Santos, Martin, said the voice of the coroner. Yeah, Carl, what do you got for me? Unless you have any reason to suspect a murder, I'd have to say shark. And a big bastard, too. Even the screw on an ocean liner wouldn't have done this. It might have cut her in two, but... Okay, Carl. Spare me the gore. My stomach's not too hot already. Brody 
hung up, typed shark attack in the cause of death space on the forms and leaned back in his chair. It was the beginning of the summer season, and Brody knew that on the success or failure of those twelve brief weeks rested the fortunes of Amity for a whole year. Local merchants all needed a boom summer to support them through the winter. Even after the best of summers, Amity winters were rough. Brody knew people would be against publicizing the attack. Still, he thought, one death in mid-June before the crowds come would probably be quickly forgotten. The fish might well have disappeared already. But Brody wasn't willing to gamble lives on the possibility. He intended to close the beaches for a couple of days, to give the shark time to travel from the Amity shoreline. He called the editor of the Amity Leader, Harry Meadows. Harry? Free for lunch? My place or yours, said Meadows. Suddenly Brody wished he had not called at mealtime. His stomach was still groaning, and the thought of food nauseated him. Uh, yours, I guess. Uh, why don't we order from size? Brody called his wife, Ellen, to tell her that he would not be home for lunch, and when he arrived, Meadows, an immense man, was unwrapping his lunch with the loving care of a jeweler showing off rare gems. He slid Brody's sandwich across the desk to him. Food may kill me, Meadows said, seeing Brody's expression, but I'd rather go my way than end up in the belly of a shark. <laughs> Brody was in the midst of swallowing an egg sandwich. Don't do that to me, he said. They ate in silence. When Brody finished, he leaned back and lit a cigarette. Now about the Watkins thing. The coroner says it was a shark attack, clear and simple. And if you'd seen the body, you'd agree. I did see it. Brody was astonished mostly because he couldn't imagine how anyone who had seen that mess could be sitting there now licking lemon pie filling off his fingers. So, you agree? Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's what killed her. I'll tell you. I called a young guy I know up at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. I described the body to him, and he said it's likely that only one kind of shark would do that. What kind? A great white... There are others that attack people, but this fellow, Hooper, Matt Hooper, he told me that to cut a woman in half like that, you'd have to have a fish with a mouth like this. He spread his hands about three feet apart. And the only shark that grows that big and attacks people is the great white. And there's another name for them. Oh? Man-eater. And he also said that it's common for a great white to come into water this cold. You've done a lot of checking into this, Harry. Well, it seemed to me a matter of public interest to determine what happened and the chances of it happening again. And did you determine those chances? I did. They're almost non-existent. This was a real freak accident. Meadows looked at Brody who returned his gaze silently. So it seems to me, Martin, that there's no reason to get the public all upset over something that's almost sure not to happen again. That's one way to look at it, Harry. Another is, since it's not likely to happen again, there's no harm in telling people that it did happen. This once. Meadows sighed. But we have to think of what's best for the people. If I run a story saying that a young woman was bitten in two by a monster shark off Amity, we can kiss the summer goodbye. Sharks are like axe murderers, Martin. People react to them with their guts. Brody nodded. Harry, I won't dispute your odds or anything. But if you're wrong, and we don't say a word, and somebody else gets hit by that fish, what then? My ass is in a sling. I'm supposed to protect people around here. The least I can do is warn them that there is a danger. And your ass is in a sling, too. 
you're supposed to report the news. And there's just no question that someone killed by a shark is news. I want you to run the story, Harry. And I want to close the beaches. Just for a couple of days. Meadows sat back in his chair. Well, I can't speak for your job, Martin, but as far as mine is concerned, the decision's already been made. There won't be any story about the attack in the leader. I've gotten six phone calls already this morning, five from advertisers, and the sixth from Mr. Coleman in New York. Mr. Coleman, who owns 55% of this paper. Brody stubbed out his cigarette. Okay, Harry. Well, even if you're not going to run a story, I'm going to close the beaches. Ten minutes after Brody returned to his office, the intercom sounded. Mayor's here to see you, Chief. Brody smiled. <laughs> Send his honor in. Larry Vaughn was a handsome man, in his early fifties, with a full head of salt-and-pepper hair and a body kept trim by exercise. He had made a great deal of money in post-war real estate in Amity, and he was the senior partner in the most successful agency in town. Brody liked him. I just talked to Harry Meadows, Vaughn said as he entered Brody's office. Where are you going to get the authority to close the beaches? Well, Larry, officially, I'm not sure I have it, Brody said. But I figure it's my responsibility to keep the people who live here as safe as I can. I don't want you to close the beaches. So I see. The 4th of July isn't far off, and that's the make-or-break weekend. This town doesn't need that kind of publicity. We'd be cutting our own throats. It doesn't need any more people killed, either. Nobody's going to get killed, for God's sake. All you'd be doing by closing the beaches is inviting a lot of reporters to come snooping around where they don't have any business. If you won't listen to reason, will you listen to me as a friend? <laughs> I'm under a lot of pressure. I'm sorry, Larry. If you don't listen to me, you may not have your job much longer. And from his jacket pocket, Vaughn took a copy of the corporate charter. Read it yourself. It's right here. Even though you were elected to the chief's job by the people, the select men have the power to remove you. Brody read the paragraph. You really do want this, don't you, Larry? Trust me, Martin, you won't be sorry. Brody sighed. I don't like it. It doesn't smell good. But if it's that important, it is that important. And we do have one thing going for us. Miss Watkins was a nobody, a drifter, no family. So she won't be missed. For the next few days, the weather remained clear and unusually calm. Sunday was the 20th of June. By noon, the beach in front of Scotch and Old Mill Roads was speckled with people. Husbands lay semi-comatose on beach towels, trying to gain strength from the sun before an afternoon of tennis and the trip back to New York. Wives leaned against aluminum backrests, reading John Cheever and interrupting themselves now and then to pour a cup of dry vermouth from the cooler. Little children played in the sand at the water's edge. A boy of six gave up skimming flat stones and flopped down next to his mother. Hey, Mom, I'm bored. How can you be bored? His mother said. You got a whole beach to play on. Can I go swimming? No, it's too cold. Can I go out my raft then? I won't go swimming. She looked down the beach. A few dozen yards away, a man stood in waist-deep water with a child on his shoulders. Oh, all right, she said, but don't go too far out. The child stood up, grabbed his rubber raft, and walked into the sea. A swell caught the raft and lifted it with the boy aboard. He paddled with both arms, stroking smoothly as a gentle current carried him slowly 
offshore. The great fish swam slowly, its tail waving just enough to maintain motion. It had been moving parallel to the shoreline. Now it turned, banking slightly, and followed the bottom gradually upward. The boy was resting, his arms dangling down, his feet and ankles dipping in and out of the water with each small swell. He noticed that he had been carried out and he began to kick and paddle towards shore. The fish did not hear the sound, but rather registered the sharp and jerky impulses emitted by the kicks. They were signals, and the fish locked on to them, homing. It rose, slowly at first, then gaining speed as the signals grow stronger. The boy stopped for a moment to rest and the signals ceased. The fish slowed, turning its head from side to side. The boy lay perfectly still, and the fish passed beneath him, skimming the sandy bottom. When the boy resumed paddling, sending new signals, the fish rose. Nearly vertical, the mouth opened, and with a final sweep of the sickle tail, it struck. The boy's last, only thought, was that he had been punched in the stomach. He had no time to cry out. The fish's head drove the raft out of the water, and the jaws smashed together, engulfing head, arms, shoulders, trunk, pelvis, and most of the raft. Nearly half of the fish had come clear of the water, and it slid forward and down in a belly-flopping motion, grinding the mass of flesh and bone and the rubber. On the beach, the man with the child shouted, Hey! Did you see that? Out there! A shark or a whale or something! Something huge! The boy's mother opened her eyes and squinted at the man. She didn't understand what he was saying, but he was pointing at the water. So she shaded her eyes and looked out to sea. At first, the fact that she saw nothing didn't strike her as odd. Then she remembered, and she said, Alex! The phone rang when Brody was at home having lunch with his wife, Ellen. Bixby, chief, said the voice from the station house. What is it, Bixby? I think you'd better come down. I've got this hysterical woman on my hands, chief. What's she hysterical about? Her kid. Out by the beach? A twinge of unease shot through Brody's stomach. I'll be right there. He felt flushed almost feverish. Fear and guilt and fury blended in a thrust of gut-wrenching pain. He should have closed the beaches. Harry Meadows was waiting in the parking lot when Brody drove up. Who's in there, Harry? A man from the New York Times? Uh, the woman? And the man who says he saw it happen? How did the Times get hold of it? Oh, bad luck, he was on the beach. And do they know about the Watkins thing? I don't know. But if the time's prints, then I'll have to, too. Who are you going to say ordered it hushed up? Larry Vaughn? I'm not going to say anybody ordered it hushed up. What about the truth? What about telling it the way it happened? Say that I wanted to close the beaches and warn people, but the select men disagreed. And say that because I was too much of a chicken to fight and put my job on the line, I went along with them. Oh, come on, Martin. We took a gamble and lost. It's all there is to it. Brody entered his office through a side door 
leaving Harry to go in the front. A man stood by the back wall. The boy's mother, a Mrs. Kintner, was sitting in front of the desk clutching a handkerchief. She was wearing a robe over her bathing suit. Her feet were bare. The young man stepped forward. Bill Whitman, from the New York Times, are you prepared to list this as a shark attack? Listen, Mr. Whitman, we have no witnesses who saw anything but a splash. We have no body, no real evidence that anything violent happened to the boy. I mean, except that he's missing. The sound of tires grinding over gravel out front stopped Brody. A car door slammed, and Len Hendricks charged into the station, wearing nothing but a bathing suit. Chief, there's been another attack, said Hendricks. Oh, when was the first one? The Times man asked quickly. Before Hendricks could answer, Brody jumped in. We were discussing it, Leonard. I don't want anyone jumping to conclusions. For God's sake, the boy could have drowned. Boy, said Hendricks. What boy? This was a man. It was an old man. Five minutes ago, he was just beyond the surf. He suddenly, he screamed, and his head went under, and blood was flying all over the place. That's the biggest damn fish I ever saw in my whole life. Big as a station wagon. Hendricks paused, staring at the floor. His breath squeezed out of his chest in short bursts. He looked up, his eyes red and filling with tears of exhaustion and fright. Jesus. Leonard, go put on some clothes and find some notices that close the beaches, said Brody. One way or another, let's get the goddamn beaches closed. Monday morning. Brody arrived at the office a little after seven. The New York Times lay in the center of his desk. Shark kills two on Long Island. Damn, he said, and he began to read. When he looked up, Meadows was in the doorway holding out a copy of the Amity Leader, and its headline ran, Two Killed by Monster Shark Off Amity Beach. Below that, in smaller type, number of victims of killer fish rises to three. Jesus, Harry, said Brody. He really put it to me. Is there anything else I should read in this? No, I just quote Matt Hooper, Meadows said. That fellow from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Oh, yeah? And what does he say? Well, he says it would be remarkable if we ever have another attack, but he's a little less sure than he was last time. That a fact. And he thinks it's a big white. And Hooper said that there was one thing we could do. Now that you got the beaches closed down, we could chum, you know, spread fish guts around in the water. Oh, great. That's what we need to attract sharks. And what if he shows up? What do we do then? Catch him! With what? My trusty spinning rod? No, oh, a harpoon. A harpoon, Harry? I don't even have a police boat, let alone a, a boat with harpoons on it. Well, there are fishermen around. They have boats. Ben Gardner, for instance. Yeah, but... A commotion out in the hall stopped him in mid-sentence, and a woman's voice cried, Bullshit! I don't care what he's doing. I am going in there. The door to Brody's office flew open, and standing in the doorway, clutching a newspaper, tears streaming down her face, was Alex Kintner's mother. Come in, Mrs. Kintner, said Brody. What can I do? The woman slapped the newspaper across his face. It didn't hurt Brody so much as startled him. What about this? Mrs. Kintner screamed. They say here that you knew it was dangerous to swim, that somebody had already been killed by that shark that you kept in a secret. Brody couldn't deny it. You killed Alex! She shrieked the words, and Brody was sure they were heard in the parking lot, on the street, in the center of the town, on the beaches all over Amity. Oh, you evil man! she said. 
You evil, evil man! When at last Mrs. Kintner left, Brody looked at his watch. It's not even nine o'clock yet, if ever I felt like I could use a drink. Ah, oh, you gotta try not to take what she said too seriously. I mean, the woman was in shock. The point is, the two deaths yesterday could have been prevented. I could have prevented them, and I didn't, period. He took a breath. Let's get on to Ben Gardner. I don't know if he's ever caught any sharks, but anything's worth a try. Thursday morning was foggy. A wet, ground fog so thick that it had a taste, sharp and salty. Around midday it lifted. Sunlight streaked through the clouds, stabbing shiny patches of blue onto the gray-green surface of the sea. Brody sat on the public beach, his elbows resting on his knees, to steady the binoculars in his hands. When he lowered the glasses, he could barely see the boat, a white speck that disappeared and reappeared in the ocean swells. Hey, Chief, Hendricks said, walking up to him. I saw your car. And... What are you doing? I'm trying to figure out what the hell Ben Garden is doing. I haven't seen anything move on his boat in an hour. How long has he been out there? All day, I think. And I hope to hell he didn't go alone. Well, you want to go see? We got at least two more hours of daylight. I can borrow Chickering's boat. Brody felt a shimmer of fear skitter up his back. He was a poor swimmer, and the prospect of being on top of, let alone in water above his head, gave him what his mother used to call the whim-whams. Okay, he said. I don't guess we got much choice. You go get the boat ready, and I'll give his wife a call, see if he's called in on the radio. Amity's town dock was small, with only twenty slips, a fuel dock, and a wooden shack where hot dogs and fried clams were sold in cardboard sleeves. Hendricks was standing in a boat, the engine running. What did she say? asked Hendricks. Not a word. She's been trying to raise him for half an hour. Brody climbed aboard. The boat lurched ahead, chugging. Any life jackets? asked Brody. Oh, just the cushions. They'd hold you up, all right, if you're an eight-year-old boy. Oh, thanks. Gardner's boat was about three-quarters of a mile from shore. As they drew nearer, Hendricks throttled down, and they closed quickly. There were no signs of life. Hey, Ben? As they drew level, Brody grabbed the gunner. Hendricks looped the line over the railing and they climbed aboard. You in there, Ben? Hendricks called. A sudden noise made Brody jump. Whiskey Zebra Echo 259er, said a voice cracking over the radio. You there, Jake? So much for that theory, said Brody. He never turned off his radio. I don't get it, Chief. He didn't carry a dinghy and he swam like a fish, so... Brody gazed down into the water. For a moment, he stared dumbly at the transom, unseeing. Then the pattern began to take shape. A pattern of holes, deep gouges in the wooden transom, forming a rough semicircle more than three feet across. And at the bottom of the transom, just at the waterline, three short smears of blood. Please, God thought Brody. Not another one. If I hold your legs, Leonard, you think you can lean over and take a look at those holes down there? I guess so. Hold me tight, Chief, please. Brody took one of Hendrick's legs under each arm and lifted. Hendrix rose, then bent over the transom. Son of a bitch, he said, struggling with something. 
Look at that thing. Hey, pull me up. Brody stepped backward, hoisting Hendrix over the transom. Look, I got this. It was stuck in one of them holes. Into Brody's palm, Hendrix dropped a triangle of glistening white denticle. It was nearly two inches long. The sides were tiny saws. My God, he said. It's a tooth, isn't it? Jesus Christ Almighty. You think the shark got Ben? I don't know what else to think, said Brody. He looked at the tooth again and then dropped it into his pocket. They arrived at the dock in late twilight. Harry Meadows and another man unknown to Brody were waiting for him. You sure have good antenna, Harry, Brody said as he climbed onto the dock. Meadows smiled, flattered. This is Matt Hooper, a Chief Brody. The two men shook hands. You're the fellow from Woods Hole, Brody said, trying to get a look at him in the fading light. He was young, mid-twenties, and handsome, tanned, hair bleached by the sun. Yeah, that's right, said Hooper. Meadows said, I called him. I thought he might be able to figure out what's going on. Brody sensed his own resentment at the intrusion, the implicit division of authority that Hooper's arrival had created. What did you find out there? Meadows asked. Come on back to the station and I'll fill you in. Is Ben going to stay out there all night? Brody paused. It looks that way, Harry. Brody arrived at police headquarters before Meadows and Hooper. It was almost eight o'clock. Do I gather that Ben Gardner has become victim number four? Meadows asked. Brody nodded. I think so. We found this. Leonard dug it out of the wood. He flipped the tooth to Hooper, who turned it over in his hand. What do you think, Matt? It's a white. How big? Well, I can't be sure, but big. Fifteen, twenty feet. That is some fantastic fish. Brody asked, How much would a fish like that weigh? Oh, five or six thousand pounds. Brody whistled. Three tons. Do you have any thoughts about what happened? Meadows asked. From what the chief says, it sounds like the fish killed Mr. Gardner. How? Well, any number of ways. Gardner might have fallen overboard. More likely, he was pulled over. His leg may have gotten tangled in a harpoon line. He could have even been taken while he was leaning over the stern. How do you account for the teeth in the stern? Well, the fish attacked the boat. What the hell for? Sharks, they're not very bright, Chief. They exist on instinct and impulse. The impulse to feed is powerful. But a thirty-foot boat? A shark doesn't think. To the shark, it was just something large. There's nothing in the sea that this fish would fear. Do you have any idea why he's hung around here so long? I don't know how much you know about the water here, but... Oh, I grew up here. You did? In Amity? No. Southampton. I spent every summer there, from grade school through grad school. Every summer? So you didn't really grow up there? Well, okay, so I wasn't born here. But I've spent a lot of time in these waters, and I wrote a paper on this coastline. Anyway, this isn't an environment that would normally support a long stay by a shark. So why is this one staying? What is it about Amity? It is impossible to say the shark could be sick, changes in water temperature or current flow, or feeding patterns could cause him to stay. There's no real answer. Okay, but is there anything you plan to do to get an answer? Yeah, I'll take water samples here and in East Hampton. I'll try to find out how other fish are behaving. Oh, and I'll try to find that shark. Which reminds me, is there a boat available? Yes, I'm sorry to say. Ben Gardner's. 
He can use it, at least until we work out something with his wife. Do you really think you can catch that fish? Oh, I didn't say I was going to catch it. Then what the hell are you going to do? Brody looked into Hooper's eyes. I want that fish killed. And if you can't do it, we'll find someone who can. Hooper laughed. You sound like a mobster. I want that fish killed. So go get a contract out on him. Who are you going to get to do the job? I don't know. What about it, Harry? Isn't there any fisherman on this whole damn island equipped to catch big sharks? Meadows thought. There may be one. I don't know much about him, but I think his name is Quint. And I think he operates out of a private pier somewhere around Promised Land. Yeah, he sounds like a possible. Look, Chief, you can't go off half-cocked looking for vengeance against a fish. That shark is not evil. It's not a murderer. It's just obeying its own instincts, trying to get retribution against a fish. It's crazy. Brody knew Hooper was right. But the people of Amity would demand the death of the fish. They would need to see it dead before they could feel secure enough to resume their normal lives. And most of all, Brody needed to see it dead. The phone rang. Hello, Martin. How are you? Mayor Vaughn's voice was friendly, almost effusively so, Brody thought. As well as could be expected, Larry. I heard about Ben Gardner. News travels fast. Are you sure it was the shark again? Yeah, I guess so. Nothing else seems to make sense. Martin... What are you going to do? There was a pathetic urgency in Vaughn's voice. That's a good question, Larry. We've got the beaches closed down, and we have I'm aware of that, but I'm thinking, what would you say to opening the beaches just for the 4th of July weekend? Not a chance in hell. Now listen. No, you listen, Larry. The last time I listened to you, we had two people killed. If we catch that fish, if we kill the son of a bitch, then we'll open the beaches. Until then, forget it. On her way home, Friday noon, after a morning of volunteer work at the hospital, Ellen Brody stopped at Amity Hardware. There was no response to the tinkle of the bell that the door struck as she opened it. She waited for a few seconds and then called, Albert. Ellen Brody was 36, five years younger than her husband. Summers were bad times for her, for in the summer she was tortured by thoughts of lives that could have been. She saw people she'd grown up with, prep school classmates, now married to bankers and brokers, summering in Amity and wintering in New York. Women who, Ellen was convinced, joked among themselves about Ellen Shepard marrying that policeman. Ellen was twenty-one when she met Brody. She had just finished her junior year at Wesley and was spending the summer in Amity with her parents and not eager to live a life that was a repetition of her parents. When Brody asked her out to dinner, she accepted out of curiosity. She found him strong, simple, kind. Sincere. They were married that November. Although the shedding of her summer people stigma earned her the affection of year-round residents of Amity, it cost her much that was pleasant in the first twenty-one years of her life. It was as if she had moved to another country. Hi, Ellen. What can I do for you? Albert Morris, the owner, came out from back of the store. I need a new nozzle for my kitchen sink. No problem. Eighty cents. So, lots of people upset about this shark thing. Yeah, I know. You can't blame them. Well, maybe this new fella can help us out. Who's that? This fish expert from up Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Hooper. Oh, yes, I heard he was in town. He's right here. Ellen turned 
and saw Hooper coming through the door and suddenly felt a surge of girlish nervousness. There was something familiar about him. I found them, said Hooper, holding up two large stainless steel cleats, handing Morris a twenty-dollar bill. Ellen looked at Hooper, trying to define the familiarity. Excuse me, she said, but I have to ask you, you're not related to David Hooper, are you? He's my older brother. Do you know David? Yes, or rather I used to. I went out with him a long time ago. I'm Ellen Brody. I used to be Ellen Shepherd back then, I mean. Oh, sure. I remember you. Hey, let me see. You wore your hair shorter then, a sort of page boy, and yours were a, a charm bracelet? Ella laughed. <laughs> My heavens, you have quite a memory. Well, at one time or another, said Hooper, I fell in love with all the girls David went out with. Oh. Morris handed Hooper his change, and they walked out of the store together. So, now you're a scientist? she said when they were outside. Yeah, I took a course in marine biology, got hooked on fish, or, to be really specific, sharks. What an awful thing to fall in love with. Oh, no. Sharks are beautiful. God, how beautiful they are. They're like an impossibly perfect piece of machinery. They're graceful as any bird. He stopped. He looked at Ellen and smiled. I'm sorry, as you can see, I'm, I'm an addict. But that's all right. Uh, tell me about David. Oh, he's okay. He's a broker in San Francisco. He's on his second wife. If David had any sense, he would have held on to you. Ellen blushed. So what lucky girl finally got you? Well, none so far. <laughs> Hooper laughed. Tell me about yourself. No, 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 don't. Let me guess. Uh, three children, right? Right. And your husband is a lawyer? Ellen shook her head, smiling. No, no, not quite. My husband is the police chief in Amity. Hooper let the surprise show in his eyes for only an instant. Then he smacked himself on the forehead and said, Oh, of course, Brody. I never made the connection. I met your husband last night. Seems like quite a guy. Ellen thought she detected a flicker of irony in Hooper's voice. How long will you be here? She said. Well, that depends on what happens with this fish, but I hope I'll see you before I go. I, I'd like that, said Ellen, shaking his hand. The weekend was as quiet as the weekends in the late fall, with the beaches closed and with the police patrolling them during the daylight hours. Amity was practically deserted. Hooper cruised up and down the shore in Ben Gardner's boat, but the only signs of life he saw in the water were schools of baitfish and one small school of bluefish. By Sunday night, he was ready to conclude that the fish had gone back to the deep. What makes you think so? Brody had asked. Well, it's not a sign of him, said Hooper. And there are other fish around. If there was a big white in this neighborhood, everything else would vanish. When they're around, there's an awful stillness in the water. I'm not convinced, said Brody. At least not enough to open the beaches. Not yet. He knew that after an uneventful weekend, there would be pressure from the mayor, from real estate agents, from merchants to open the beaches. He almost wished Hooper had seen the fish. On Monday afternoon, Brody was sitting in his office when Ellen called. What do you think about giving a dinner party? What for? We just have a dinner party. We haven't had one in years. My guess is all right if you want to. Who are you going to invite? I think we should have Matt Hooper. Hooper? What didn't I tell you? I, I ran into him in Albert Morris's on Friday. I'm sure I mentioned it to you. It turns out he's the brother of the Hooper that I, I used to know. Oh. When are you planning the shindig for? 
I was thinking about tomorrow night, maybe six or eight people, the Baxters. Oh, you mean summer people. Okay. Who else? Uh, somebody I can talk to. How about the Meadows? All right. And some nice young thing for Hooper. A girl. Yeah, if you think so. Okay, well, I'll see you later, Brody said. And he hung up. He saw something ominous in this dinner party. He couldn't be sure, but he believed that Ellen was launching another campaign to re-enter the world he had taken her from. And this time, she had a lever with which to jimmy her way in. Hooper. At 7.05 the next evening, the doorbell rang and Brody answered it. Hooper was outside wearing bell-bottom blue jeans, loafers, and a red Lacoste shirt. It was the uniform of the young and rich in Amity. In his blue madras shirt and slacks, Brody felt outclassed. Hi, he said. Come in. Matt, said Ellen. I'm so glad you could come. I'm sorry I don't look more respectable. I only brought working clothes. Oh, don't be silly. You look wonderful. I have something for the hostess, said Hooper, pulling out a small package wrapped in tissue. To make up for my clothes? Ellen carefully unwrapped the paper. Inside was a charm. Oh, it's lovely, she said. What is it? It's a tiger shark tooth. There's supposed to be a superstition that if you keep it with you, you'll be safe from shark bite. Under the present circumstances, I thought it would be appropriate. Oh, I'll put it on right now. You never know when you might meet a shark at dinner. Brody went into the kitchen to fix a drink. He took a breath and clenched and unclenched his fists. He felt Ellen was trying to impress Hooper. Christ, he had to be ten years younger than her. Or almost. So why was she putting on her super-sophisticated act? He mixed himself a large rye and ginger and took a long slug. Then he mixed the other drinks, topped himself up with more rye, and took them through, just as the boys came downstairs. Come here, boys. Meet Mr. Hooper, said Ellen. Mr. Hooper is an oceanographer. An ichthyologist, actually he said. A zoologist who specializes in fish life? Are you going to catch the shark? asked Martin Jr. Well, I'm going to try to find him. The Meadows arrived at the same time as Daisy Wicker, a tall, slim girl with long, straight hair. Brody led them into the living room and took orders for more drinks. When he returned, Daisy Wicker was standing alone, gazing around, smiling. Thinking of something funny? No, I guess I've never been in a policeman's house before. Well, what did you expect? Bars on the windows? No, I was just curious. Do you like being a policeman? Yes. It's a good job and it has a purpose to it. Don't you feel alienated? Why the hell should I feel alienated? Alienated from what? From the people. I mean, the only thing that justifies your existence is telling people what not to do. Doesn't that make you feel freaky? No, I don't feel freaky. Excuse me, he said. I have to tend to the other guests. Sure, nice talking to you. Ellen was in the kitchen. Where the hell did you find that girl, he said. Under a rock? Who? Daisy? He poured himself another drink. What is the matter with you? Well, I guess I don't like strange people coming into my house and insulting me. Oh, Martin, for my sake, please. Don't worry. But halfway through the meal, a wave of nausea hit him. It was the wine. It had to be the wine. He was distracted by the image of Ellen talking to Hooper. Every time she spoke, she touched his arm. Lightly, 
But, Brody thought, intimately, as if they were sharing secrets. I sure as hell feel alienated right now, he thought. When the guests finally departed, they cleared up in silence. In the bedroom, when Brody was undressing, the thought occurred to him that the source of this whole mess was a fish, a mindless beast that he had never seen. The ludicrousness of that thought made him smile. Brody awoke with a start, jilted by a signal that told him something was wrong. He sat up and saw Ellen sitting by the window. Rain splashed against the window panes. Lousy day, huh? He said. She didn't answer, continuing to stare fixedly at the drops sliding down the glass. How come you're up so early? Couldn't sleep. Well, I'm sure I didn't have any trouble. I'm not surprised. Oh, boy. Are we starting that again? No. I, I didn't mean anything. She seemed subdued. Sad. I've got a full day at the hospital. Do you think you can drop the boys off on your way to work? No problem. I'll pick them up on my way home. As soon as they had left, Ellen picked up the phone. She could hear her heart beating as she dialed the number. Abelard Arms? Uh, Mr. Hooper's room, please. Matt Hooper? Ellen heard the phone ring once, then again. Hello? said Hooper's voice. Hi, it's me. I mean, it's Ellen. Oh, hi. Now, she said to herself, do it. I was wondering if, if there was any chance you'd like to, if you're free for lunch. Lunch? Yes, just you and me. I don't want to interfere with your plans or anything. No, no, that's okay. I can't go out in the boat in this weather. What did you have in mind? There's a wonderful place up in Sag Harbor. Uh, Banners. Do you know it? She had heard that it was good, and it was quiet. Uh, no, said Hooper, but sounds good. Around 12.30, then? Ellen hung up. Her hands were still shaking. It was 12.15 when she arrived at Banners, a small steak and seafood restaurant on the water. The restaurant was dark. Ellen took a booth and ordered a gin and tonic. When it came, she drank half of it immediately. Hello? The word startled Ellen. Hooper slid into the seat opposite her and said, I didn't mean to scare you. He looked into her eyes and smiled. It's going to happen. Ellen thought. She felt suddenly nervous. She wanted to tell him why she was behaving this way, to explain that she didn't do this all the time. Do you know what I'd love? She said, finally. Some wine. That's a very interesting idea, Hooper said, looking at her. But I may become irresponsible. Oh, I'm not worried. Hooper ran his tongue over his lips and leaned forward until his face was only a foot from hers. Ellen thought, the door's open now. All you have to do is walk through it. Ellen arrived home a little before 4.30. She went upstairs and turned on the water in the tub. Afterwards, she powdered herself, put on a fresh nightgown, and climbed into bed. Almost instantly, it seemed, she was awakened by a voice. Hey there, are you okay? She opened her eyes and saw Brody sitting on the end of the bed. She sat up. What time is it? Six. I got the kids. I figured I'd better once I couldn't reach you. You try to reach me? A couple of times. 
I was calling to apologize for whatever I did that got you upset last night. The twinge of shame struck Ellen. I, I felt so awful I took a pill and went to bed. Brody shook his head. I really am going to throw those damn things down the john. Have you heard from Hooper? Ellen thought for a moment. Oh, he called to say thank you. Why? Well, I tried to get hold of him today a couple of times. He was probably with Daisy Wicker in some hotel room. On the Thursday morning, Brody got a call summoning him to Vaughn's office for a meeting of the Board of Selectmen. The mayor's office was on the second floor of the town hall, overlooking the town, and in the distance, the Atlantic Ocean. Are they all inside? he asked Vaughn's secretary, Janet. Well, all that's coming, she said. Plus, there's that Mr. Hooper. When was he elected a selectman? I don't know, she said, but he sure is cute. Sorry, Janet. He's spoken for. Oh, by who? Daisy Wicker. Janet laughed. What's funny? Janet lowered her voice. Daisy Wicker? Wouldn't be interested. Well, I'll be damned. But as he entered the office, Brody said to himself, Okay, so where the hell was Hooper yesterday? As soon as he was inside the office, Brody knew that he would be fighting alone. God, he looks awful, Brody thought, as he watched Vaughn drag a straight-back chair across the room. Looks like he hasn't slept in a month. When everyone was finally seated, Vaughn said, you all know why we're here, and uh, I guess it's safe to say there's only one of us that needs convincing about what we should do. You mean me, said Brody. Vaughn nodded. Look, Martin, the town is dying. People are out of work. Every day we keep the beaches closed, we drive another nail into our own coffin. Suppose you do open the beaches for the fourth, Larry, said Brody. And suppose someone gets killed. It's a calculated risk. We think it's worth taking. Mr. Hooper? First of all, nobody's seen the fish in a week. Nobody's been in the water either. That's true. But I've been on the boat looking for him every day. Well, every day but one. Yeah, I meant to ask you about that. Where were you yesterday? It rained, Hooper said. I don't have to report in every five minutes, do I? Anyway, I haven't seen a trace of that fish, and the water's getting warmer. Great whites prefer cooler water. So you think it's gone further north? Or out deeper, into colder water? It could have gone south. You can't predict what these things are going to do. That's my point. You can't predict it. So all you're doing is guessing. Vaughn said, Look, you can't ask for a guarantee, Martin. Tell that to Christine Watkins, or the Kintner boy's mother. I know, but we have to do something. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one way to go. The decision's been made, said Brody. You could say that, yeah. And when someone else gets killed? Who's taking the blame this time? Who's going to talk to the husband or the mother or the wife and tell them, oh, we're just playing the odds? And we lost. Don't be so negative, Martin. If those beaches stay closed over the 4th of July weekend, you won't have your job very long. Like, I'm not threatening. I'm telling you. We can still have a summer, but we have to tell people it's safe to come here. Twenty minutes after they hear that you won't open the beaches, the people of this town will impeach you or find a rail and run you out on it. Brody stood up abruptly. He went over to the window and looked out over the town and the ocean beyond. Sometime, sooner or later, the beaches would have to be opened, even if they never saw the fish again. Okay, Larry, I'll open the beaches, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to post men on the beaches, and I'm going to have Hooper patrol in the boat, and... 
I'm going to make sure every person who comes down there knows the danger. You can't do that, Vaughn said. I can do it, Larry. And I will. Saturday, noon, on the 4th of July weekend. Brody stood on a dune overlooking the Scotch Road beach, feeling half-secret agent, half-fool. Offshore, between a quarter and a half a mile, Ben Gardner's old boat, Flicka, moved slowly eastward. Brody watched the boat through his binoculars and said to himself, at least I know where Hooper is today. The Coast Guard had been right. The day was cloudless and warm with a light onshore breeze. The beach was crowded. A dozen or so teenagers were scattered about in their ritual rows. A family was gathered around a charcoal fire in the sand, and the scent of grilling hamburger drifted into Brody's nose. No one had yet gone swimming. Hearing footsteps, he turned to see a family struggling up the dune. Can I help you? Brody said. Is this the beach? said the woman. This is it, all right, said the man. He spoke with the unmistakable accent of the Queensboro New Yorker. Where's the shark? said one of the children, a fat boy of about thirteen. Thought you said we were going to see a shark. Yeah. Where's this hotshot shark? We've seen it on TV. There's a shark that kills people. There was a shark here, said Brody, but it's not here now. You mean we drove all the way out here to see the shark and he's gone? He snarled. You said we'd see a shark, whined one of the boys. Come on. The family trudged down the dune and onto the beach. Brody looked at his watch. Twelve fifteen. He reached into the beach bag and took out the walkie-talkie. You there, Leonard? Yeah, I read you, Chief. Over. Anything going on? Uh, no, there are some TV guys here interviewing people. Over. About what? Just the standard stuff, you know? Are you scared to go swimming? What do you think about the shark? Over. Well, as long as they're not causing any trouble. Nope. Over. Okay. Hey, Leonard, you don't have to say over all the time. I can tell when you're finished speaking. It's just procedure, Chief. Keeps things clear. Over and out. Brody waited a moment and then pushed the button again and said, Hooper, this is Brody. Anything out there? Hooper? Sorry, I was out in the stern. I thought I saw something. What did you see? Nothing. Uh, my eyes were playing tricks on me. What did you think you saw? A shadow, maybe. Uh, the sunlight can fool you. Okay, I'll check with you later. By 2.30, the only ones left on the beach were half a dozen teenagers and the family from Queens. Brody's legs had begun to sunburn, and he decided to take a walk. He heard the sound of an engine and turned to see a white truck parking on Scotch Road. The driver's door opened and a man got out and trudged towards him. He was young, with long, curly hair, and a handlebar mustache. Chief Brody, I'm Bob Middleton, Channel 4 News. I'd like to interview you about the whole shark business, how you decided to open the beaches. Brody thought for a moment. Well, what the hell, he said to himself. Little publicity couldn't hurt the town. All right. Where? Uh, down on the beach, I'll get the crew, and I'll give you a yell when we're ready. Since he decided to take a walk, Brody thought that he might as well take it. He headed down to the water, and as he passed a group of teenagers, he heard a boy say, What about it? Anybody got the guts? Ten bucks is ten bucks. How far out do I have to go? Well, let's see. A hundred yards? Okay, you got a deal. A boy stood up and began to jog towards the water. Brody walked over to the boy do you want to go swimming? he asked. The boy looked past him at his friends. Brody lowered his voice. 
Do you want me to order you not to? The boy shook his head. No, man. I could use the ten bucks. And he scampered to the water, flung himself over a small wave, and began to swim. Bob Middleton and his crew dashed past Brody. How much do you want of this, said the cameraman, tracking the boy as he swam. Let's just stay here till he comes out and be ready, just in case. Suddenly, the hum of the flicker's engine changed from a low murmur to an urgent growl. Brody looked beyond the swimming boy and saw the boat in a tight, fast turn. He put the walkie-talkie to his mouth. You see something, Hooper? It was that shadow again. There's a kid swimming out there. Where? Middleton appeared and pushed the microphone into Brody's face. Uh, Thirty, maybe forty yards out. I think I'd better tell him to come in. Brody waved the microphone away and yelled, Hey, out there! Come on in! Jesus! said the sound man. You damn near blew my ears out. Hooper, Brody said. You want to toot in here and tell him to come ashore? The fish had sounded now, and was meandering a few feet above the sandy bottom, eighty feet below the flicker. For hours, its sensory system had been tracking the strange sounds above. The boat swung towards shore and kicking up a shower of spray from the bouncing bow. The boy stopped swimming and raised his head. Brody yelled, Come in! The boy waved back and started for the shore. What's going on? said the man from Queens, his two sons behind him, smiling eagerly. Nothing, said Brody. I just don't want the boy to get out too far. Is it the shark? Hey, neat, said one of the boys. At fifteen knots, it took Hooper only thirty seconds to cover the couple of hundred yards and draw near the boy. The boy heard the engine and raised his head. What's the matter? Nothing, said Hooper. Keep swimming. The boy lowered his head and swam. A swell caught him, and with two or three more strokes, he was able to stand. Come on, said Brody. I am, said the boy. What's the problem, anyway? Hooper put the boat in reverse. As he looked off the stern, he saw a silver streak moving in the gray-blue water. It seemed part of the wave motion, but it moved independently. For a second, Hooper did not realize what he was seeing. And even when the realization struck, he did not see the fish clearly. He cried, The fish! Get the kid out! Quick! The boy heard and tried to run, but in the chest-deep water his movements were slow. A swell knocked him sideways and he stumbled. Brody ran into the water and a wave hit him in the knees and pushed him back. Middleton said into the microphone, The man on the boat just said something about a fish. I don't know if he means a shark. The boy was moving faster now, pushing through the water with his chest and arms. He did not see the fin rise behind him, a sharp blade of brownish gray that hovered in the water. There it is, said the man from Queens. See it, Benny, Davy, it's right there. There, cried Middleton, pointing. I'm zooming, said the cameraman. Brody reached for the boy. His eyes were wide and panicked. He grabbed him around the chest and together they staggered out of the water. The fin dropped beneath the surface and following the slope of the ocean floor, the fish moved into the deep. Brody stood in the sand with his arm around the boy. You okay? I want to go home. The boy shivered. I bet you do. Brody retrieved his walkie-talkie. Leonard, can you hear me? The fish has been here. If you've got anybody in the water down there, get them out. This beach is officially closed. 
At six o'clock, Brody sat in his office with Hooper and Meadows. He had already talked to Larry Vaughn, who called drunk and in tears, and muttered wildly about the ruination of his life. There must be some place to go from here, something to do more than just closing the beaches, said Meadows. Did you ever look into that fisherman guy, Harry? Uh, Quint? As far as I know, he's never done anything illegal. Well, what do you say, Harry? You think he's in the phone book? You really are serious, said Hooper. You'll bet your sweet ass. You got any better ideas? Brody took a phone book from the top drawer of his desk and opened it to the queues. Here it is. Quint. There's no first name. He dialed the number. Quint, said a voice. Mr. Quint, this is Martin Brody. I'm the chief of police over in Amity. We have a problem. I have heard. The shark was around again today. Anybody get it? Uh, no, but one boy almost did. Fish that big needs a lot of food. I know. What I'm wondering is whether you can help us. I thought you might call. Can you? That depends. On what? On how much you're willing to spend, for one thing. This is a premium job. My everyday rate's 200 a day, but I think you'll pay double. Not a chance. You got no place else to go. There are other fishermen. <laughs> sure there are. You already sent one. Send another one. And then when you come back to me again, maybe you'll... Even pay triple. This fish is killing people. You're breaking my heart. Okay, Brody said finally. I guess we don't have any choice. No, you don't. There's one more thing. I'm gonna need a man with me. I've lost my mate. What, overboard? No, he quit. He got nerves. Happens to most people after a while in this work. They get to thinking too much. Well, I'll be there, you know. Brody was shocked by the words as soon as he had said them. Appalled at what he had committed himself to do. You! Ha! <laughs> Brody smarted under Quint's derision. I need a man who knows about fishing. Or at least about boats. Brody looked across his desk. The last thing he wanted was to spend days on a boat with Hooper, but he cupped his hand over the mouthpiece and said to Hooper, You want to come along, too? He needs a mate. He doesn't even have a mate? What a half-assed operation. You want to come or not? Well, I'll probably live to regret it, but yeah, I want to see that fish. Brody said to Quint, Okay, I've got your man. Does he know boats? He knows boats. Monday morning, six o'clock. You know how to get here? It's Route 27 to the turnoff of the Promised Land, right? Yep. Leads right to my dock. Yours the only boat there? Only one. It's called the Orca. See you Monday. As they rose to go, Hooper turned and said, Thinking of orca reminded me of something. You know what Australians call great white sharks? No, said Brody, not really interested. What? White death. You had to tell me, didn't you? Brody said, as he closed the door behind him. The sea was as flat as gelatin. There was no whisper of wind to ripple the surface. Now and then, a passing turn would plunge for food and rise again, and the wavelets from its dive became circles that grew without cease. The boat sat still in the water, drifting imperceptibly in the tide. 
Two fishing rods in rod holders at the stern trailed wire line into the oily slick that spread westward behind the boat. Hooper sat at the stern, a twenty-gallon garbage pail at his side. Forward, in two rows that peaked at the bow, lay ten wooden barrels the size of quarter kegs of beer. Each was wrapped in several thicknesses of three-quarter inch hemp, which continued in a hundred-foot coil beside the barrel. Tied to the end of each rope was the steel head of a harpoon. Brody sat in the swiveled fighting chair bolted to the deck, trying to stay awake. There had been no breeze at all during the six hours they had been sitting and waiting. His body odor rose to his face and, blended with the stench of the fish guts and blood being ladled overboard, nauseated him. Brody looked up at the figure on the flying bridge, Quint. He wore a white t-shirt, faded blue jeans, and a pair of graying topsider sneakers. Brody guessed Quint was about fifty, six feet four and very lean. His head was totally bald, and when, as now, the sun was high and hot, he wore a Marine Corps fatigue cap. His face, like the rest of him, was hard and sharp. When he looked down from the flying bridge, he seemed to aim his eyes. The darkest Brody had ever seen, along his nose, as if it were a rifle barrel. Brody looked at his watch. It was a little after two. Do you have a lot of days like this? Like what? His tone did not invite conversation. Like this, when you sit all day long and nothing happens. Some. And people pay you even though they never catch a thing? That doesn't happen too often. It's generally something that'll take a bait. Or something we can stick. Stick? With an iron. Quint pointed to the harpoons on the bow. What kind of things do you stick, Quint? Anything that swims by. Really? I don't think... Quint cut him off. Something's taking one of the baits. Shading his eyes with his hand, Brody looked off the stern, but as far as he could see, the slick was undisturbed, the water flat and calm. Where? You'll see. With a soft, metallic hiss, the wire on the starboard fishing rod began to feed overboard, knifing into the water in a straight silver line. Take the rod, Quinn said to Brody, and when I tell you, throw the brake and hit him. Is it the shark? said Brody. The possibility that at last he was going to confront the fish, the beast, the monster, the nightmare, made Brody's heart pound. He wiped his hands on his trousers, took the rod out of the holder, and stuck it in the swivel between his legs. Quint laughed, a short, sour yip. That thing? <laughs> no, that's just a little fella. Give you some practice for when your fish finds us. Quint watched the line for a few more seconds, and then said, Hit it! Brody pushed the small lever on the reel forward, leaned down, then pulled back. The tip of the rod bent into an arc. With his right hand, Brody began to turn the crank to reel in the fish, but the reel did not respond. Don't waste your energy, said Quint. Hooper, who had been sitting on the transom, stood up and said, Here, I'll tighten down the drag. You will not, said Quint. You tighten the drag down too far and you'll tear the hook out of his mouth. Oh, said Hooper. I thought you were supposed to know something about fishing. Hooper said nothing. He turned and sat down on the transom. Brody held onto the rod with both hands. The fish had gone deep and was moving from side to side. Brody reeled, leaning forward and cranking quickly as he picked up slack, hauling backward with the muscles in his shoulders and back. What have I got here? he said. A blue, said Quint. He must weigh half a ton. Quint laughed. Maybe a hundred fifty pounds. 
Brody hauled and leaned, hauled and leaned until he finally heard Quint say, Hold it. He stopped really. With a smooth, unhurried motion, Quint swung down the ladder from the flying bridge. He had a rifle in his hand, an old army M1. You want to see the fish? He said. Brody stood and moved to the side of the boat. In the dark water, the shark was acrylic blue. It was about eight feet long, slender, with long pectoral fins. He's beautiful, isn't he? said Hooper. Quint flicked the rifle safety to off. When the shark moved its head to within a few inches of the surface, he squeezed off three quick shots. The shark shuddered and stopped moving. He's stunned, maybe, but that's all, said Quint. Quint took a glove from one of his hip pockets, slipped his right hand into it, and grabbed the wire line. From a sheath at his belt, he took a knife. He lifted the shark clear of the water. Watch this. This always gives the folks a boot. With a single swift motion, he slit the shark's belly from the anal fin to just below the jaw. The flesh pulled apart, and the bloody entrails tumbled into the water like laundry falling from a basket. Then Quint cut the leader, and the shark slid overboard. As soon as its head was beneath the water, the shark began to thrash in the cloud of blood and innards. Now watch, said Quint. If we're lucky, in a minute other blues will come around, and they'll help him eat himself. That's quite a show. Brody watched, spellbound. In a moment he saw a flash of blue rise from below, a small shark, no more than four feet long snapped at the body of the disemboweled fish. Soon, another shark appeared, and another, and the water began to roil. Fins crisscrossed on the surface. Tails whipped the water. The frenzy continued for several minutes until only three large sharks remained, cruising back and forth beneath the surface. Jesus, said Hooper. You don't approve? That's right. I don't like to see things die for people's amusement. Quint snickered, and Hooper said, Do you? It ain't a question of liking it or not. It's what feeds me. Quint took out another hook and leader as Hooper resumed his routine of ladling chum into the water. Brody asked, Anybody want a beer? Both Quint and Hooper nodded, so... He went below and took three cans from a cooler. As he left the cabin, Brody noticed an old cracked and curling photograph of a dead shark lying on a beach thumbtacked to the bulk head. What's the picture? He asked, passing out the beers. Just a shark? Not just a shark. A big white. About 14, 15 feet. Weighed over 3,000 pounds. How did you catch it? Ironed it. But I tell you, for a while there, it was a question of who was going to catch who. What do you mean? Damn thing attacked the boat. It felt like we was hit by a freight train. Knocked my mate right on his ass. I put an iron in him and we chased him. Christ, we must have chased him halfway across the Atlantic. Why didn't he go deep? He couldn't. Not with the barrel following him. He dragged it down for a little while, but before too long, the strain got to him and he came to the surface. So we just kept following the barrel. After a couple hours, we got another two irons in him and he finally came up real quiet. Suppose the big white did come around, said Brody. What would be the first thing you'd do? Try to keep him interested so he'd stick around till we could get at him. They're pretty stupid fish. If he pulls the same crap the other one did and tacks the boat, we'll just start pumping irons into him as fast as we can and then let him wear himself down. Most likely the way he'll come will be following his nose right up the slick. And that's where we'll have to give him something special that he can't turn down. Something with a big old hook in it. 
That'll hold him until we can stick him. From the stern, where he was ladling chum, Hooper said, What's something special, Quint? Quint smiled and pointed to a green plastic garbage can. Take a look. I've been saving it for a fish like the one we're after. On anything else, it'd be a waste. Hooper walked over to the can and lifted the top. His shock at what he saw made him gasp. Floating vertically in the can full of water was a tiny bottlenose dolphin, no more than two feet long. Hooper slammed the top back on and said, You know they're protected? When I fish, son, I catch what I want. What about the laws? Don't you... Sure, those poor boys are protected. But the law wasn't put in to stop Quinn from taking one or two for bait. It was meant to stop big-time fishing for him. To stop nuts shooting him for sport. I got your message, said Hooper. Take it while you can. And if after a while there's nothing left, why? We'll just start taking something else. Oh, it's so stupid. Don't overstep, son, said Quint. The voice, toneless. What? Don't go calling me stupid. But I, I didn't mean that, for God's sake. I just meant... Let's drop it, Hooper, okay? Brody said. We're not out here to have a debate on ecology. And I don't need any of your two-bit rich kid bullshit. Oh, so that's it. Rich kid bullshit, huh? The rich kid stuff really burns your ass, doesn't it? Listen, damn you. If using one porpoise will help us save God knows how many lives, it seems a pretty good bargain. Hooper smirked and said to Brody, Oh, so now you're an expert on saving lives, are you? Well, let's see. How many could have been saved if you'd closed the beaches? Brody was on his feet, moving at Hooper, before he consciously knew he had left his chair. You shut your mouth, he said. Reflexively, he dropped his right hand to his hip. He stopped short when he felt no holster at his side. Scared by the sudden realization that if he had had a pistol, he might have used it. A quick, sharp laugh from Quint broke the thread of tension. <laughs> what a pair of assholes. I seen that coming since you came aboard this morning. The second day of the hunt was as still as the first. The breeze had died and the boat lay motionless on the glassy sea, like a paper cup in a puddle. Brody had brought a book out. He didn't want to have to fill time with conversation, conversation that might lead to a repeat of yesterday's scene with Hooper. Today they seldom spoke to one another, directing most of their comments at Quint. Brody had asked him how he knew what spot to pick to wait for the fish. Don't, said Quint. You don't know? Then how do you choose a place? Just choose one. So if we find that fish, or if he finds us, it'll be luck? Not quite. Why not? We can put out a slick. Brody gave up and read. Hooper sat at the stern with the chum ladle, methodically scooping and dumping. At a little after eleven, Quint spied the scythe dorsal fin of a swordfish coming towards them. Quint decided to harpoon it. He turned on his engine, told Brody and Hooper to reel in the lines, and drove the boat in a wide circle. One harpoon dart was attached to the throwing pole, and a line-covered barrel stood ready at the bow. Quint explained the pattern of attack. Hooper would drive the boat slowly towards the swordfish. Quint would stand at the end of the pulpit in the bow, holding the harpoon over his right shoulder, which he'd point left or right, depending on which way he wanted the boat to turn. It was like following a compass. If all went well, they would be able to creep up on the fish and Quint could plunge the iron almost straight down. 
all went well until the last moment. Somehow the fish sensed the presence of the boat and quint through, yelling Prick! and missed by six feet. They ate lunch, and when they were finished, Quint and Brody shot at the empty beer cans to pass the time. Hooper, said Quint, holding out the rifle. You want a shot? No, thanks. What's the problem? Nothing. Just don't want to shoot, that's all. Quint smiled. You worried about the cans and the water? That's an awful lot of tin we're dropping in the ocean. That's not it, said Hooper, careful not to rise to Quint's bait. I just don't feel like it. Afraid of guns? Afraid? No. Ever shot one? Sure, Hooper said. I've shot guns before. Where, in the service? No, I... Were you in the service? No. I didn't think so. What's that supposed to mean? Christ, I'd even bet you're still a virgin. Brody looked at Hooper's face to see his response, and for a split second he caught Hooper looking at him, before looking away, his face beginning to redden. He said, What's on your mind, Quint? What are you getting at? Quint leaned back in his chair and grinned. Not a thing. Just making a little friendly conversation to pass the time. For the next hour, they sat in silence. Suddenly, Quint said, his voice flat, soft, matter-of-fact, We've got a visitor. Brody snapped awake. Hooper stood up. The starboard line was running out, smooth and very fast. Take the rod, Quint said. He removed his cap and dropped it onto the bench. Brody took the rod out of the holder, fitted it between his legs, and held on. When I tell you, you hit him. The line stopped running. Wait. He's turning. He'll start again. Don't want to hit him now or he'll spit the hook. But the line lay dead in the water, limp and unmoving. After several moments, Quince said, I'll be goddamned. Reel it in. Brody cranked the line in, and it came easily, too easily. Whatever that was took the bait gentle as you please. Must have kissed it off the line. The wire had been neatly severed. Quint hopped down from the flying bridge and looked at it, and then gazed out over the slick. I think we just met your friend, he said. What? said Brody. Hooper jumped down off the transom and said excitedly, You've got to be kidding. That's terrific. That's just a guess, but I'd bet on it. This wire's been chewed clean through. One try. The fish probably didn't even know he had it in his mouth. So what do we do now, said Brody. We wait and see if he takes the other one, or if he surfaces. Well, what about using the porpoise? When I know it's him, said Quint. Then I'll give him the porpoise. They're garbage-eating machines, these fish, and I don't want to waste a prize bait on some little runt. They waited. There was no movement on the surface of the water. No birds dived, no fish jumped. Then the port line began to run. Leave it in the holder, said Quint. Adrenaline was pumping through Brody's body. He was both excited and afraid, awed by the thought of what was swimming below them, a creature whose power he could not imagine. Hooper stood at the port gunnel, transfixed by the running line. The line stopped and went limp. Damn, he's done it again. Quint flipped the bait hook overboard and fed out a few yards of line. Come on, you bugger. Let's have a look at you. The three men watched the port line. Hooper bent down, filled his ladle with chum, and tossed it into the slick. 
Something caught his eye and made him turn to the left. What he saw sucked from him a throaty grunt. Unintelligible, but enough to draw the eyes of the other two men. Jesus Christ, said Brody. No more than ten feet off the stern, slightly to the starboard, was the flat, conical snout of the fish. It stuck out of the water perhaps two feet. The top of the head was a sooty gray, pocked with two black eyes. At each side of the end of the snout, where the gray turned to cream white, were the nostrils, deep slashes in the armored hide. The mouth was open not quite halfway, a dim, dark cavern, guarded by huge triangular teeth. Fish and men confronted each other for perhaps ten seconds. Quint yelled, Get an iron! lurching for a harpoon. But just then the fish slid quietly backward into the water and disappeared. Fantastic, said Hooper. That fish is everything I thought, and more. The head, it must have been four feet across. Could be, said Quint, walking aft. Have you ever seen a fish like that, Quint? said Hooper. His eyes were bright, and he felt ebullient, vibrant. Not quite. How long, would you say? Twenty feet, maybe more. I don't know. Once they get to six feet, they're trouble. And this son of a bitch is trouble. God, I hope he comes back, said Hooper. Brody felt a chill. He looked like he was grinning. Don't make him out to be more than he is. He's just a dumb garbage bucket. How can you say that, said Hooper. That fish, it's a beauty. It's the kind of thing that makes you believe in a god. It shows you what nature can do when she sets her mind to it. Or shit, said Quint, and he climbed the ladder to the flying bridge. We got him on the surface once. He'll be back. As Quint spoke, a noise behind Hooper made him turn. It was a swishing noise, a liquid hiss. Heading straight for the boat, thirty feet away, was a triangular dorsal fin more than a foot high, knifing the water and leaving a rippled wake. It was followed by a towering tail that swatted left and right in tight cadence. It's attacking the boat, cried Brody. Quint came down from the flying bridge, cursing. No damn warning, he said. Hand me that iron. The fish was almost at the boat. It raised its flat head, gazed vacantly at Hooper with one of its black eyes, and passed under the boat. Damn him, shouted Quint. Is he still there? Your side, your side, yelled Hooper. Quint turned back in time to see the gray-brown shape of the fish as it pulled away from the boat and began to dive. He dropped the harpoon and, in a rage, snatched up the rifle and emptied the clip into the water behind the fish. Bastard! Give me some warning next time. He looked at Brody. Give you a bit of a start? More than a bit, said Brody. You can't tell me that thing's a fish. It's more like one of those things they make movies about. You know, the monster from 20 million fathoms. You think he'll come back? said Brody. I don't know, said Quint. You never know what these bastards are going to do. Ellen was fixing the children's supper when the doorbell rang and Larry Vaughn came in. The change in his appearance was so startling that she couldn't help staring. He had lost weight, and his skin looked gray and appeared to droop at the cheekbones. I stopped by to say farewell, he said. You're going away? For how long? Uh, for good. There's nothing here for me anymore. Uh, business is gone. Or soon will be. I never wanted to hurt anybody. I hope you believe that. 
I believe it, Alan said. Vaughn leaned against the sink. You know something, Alan? Sometimes I think that you and I would have made a wonderful couple. We would have fitted together and fitted in amity. You're good and strong, and I think I could have given you a life you would have loved. Ellen reddened. I'm not as strong as you think, Larry. Anyway, no point in dreaming. Goodbye. Think of me once in a while. When Vaughn left, Ellen went upstairs and sat on her bed. What would a life with Larry Vaughn have been like? There would have been money and acceptance. She would never have missed the life she led as a girl, for it would never have ended. There would have been no need for a fling with someone like Hooper. But life with Larry Vaughn would have been life of cheap satisfactions. And as she pondered, she began to recognize the richness of her life. And as her recognition grew, so did a regret that it had taken her so long to see the waste of time and emotion in trying to cling to her past. Suddenly she felt fear. Fear that she was growing up too late. That something might happen to Brody before she could savor her awareness. Something has happened to him, she thought. Oh, please, God. Not him. What the hell is it anyway? said Quint. It's a shark cage. The divers use them to protect themselves when they're swimming in the open ocean. The cage was slightly over six feet tall, six feet wide and four feet deep. Inside were a scuba tank, a regulator, a face mask, and a wetsuit. When we find the fish, I want to go down in it and take some pictures. It's foolishness, said Quint. A fish that big could eat that cage for breakfast. But would he? I think he might bump it, might even mouth it, but I can't think he'd seriously try to eat it. He would if he saw something as juicy as you inside. Look, Quint, this is the chance of a lifetime. No one's ever filmed a twenty-foot white swimming in the open ocean. Never. We're out here to kill that fish, said Brody, not make a home movie about it. Hell, I don't suppose it's my business to keep a man from killing himself if he wants to. What do you say, Brody? For several seconds, a leaden silence fell over the three men. Well, if this asshole wants to kill himself, let him, said Brody finally. Quint pushed the throttle forward, and the boat moved quickly through the calm sea. Gradually, as it fell into the rhythm of the long ocean swells, Brody's thoughts went back to Ellen and Hooper. She'd never cheated on him before. He was sure of it. She never even flirted with other men. But, he told himself, there's always a first time. The thought made his throat tighten. Where had Hooper been last Wednesday? He felt jealous, inadequate. Brody tried to read Hooper's face, searching for anything that might betray a lie, but Hooper kept his eyes fixed ahead. Eventually, Quint turned the ignition key and the engine died. There was a weight, a thickness to the sudden silence. Okay, Hooper, he said. Start chucking the shit overboard. Hooper took the top off the chum bucket and began to ladle the contents into the sea. By twelve o'clock, the breeze had come up. Not strong, but fresh enough to ripple the water and cool the men, who sat and watched and said nothing. Oh, what the hell, I'm going to have a beer, Brody said. Anybody want one? Sure, said Quint. We can shoot at the cans. As Brody took two beers from the chest, he heard Quint's flat, calm voice. There he is. Brody felt his pulse speed up. Where? Right there, said Quint. 
dead off the stern. It took Brody's eyes a moment to adjust, but then he saw the fin 30 yards away, a ragged, brownish-gray triangle that sliced through the water. Are you sure it's him? It's him, said Quint. What are you going to do? Nothing. Hooper, you keep ladling. Let's bring him in here. The fish cruised back and forth in the slick, seeming to search for the source of the bloody miasma. I don't get it, said Quint. You should come in and take a look at us. I can't get a shot at him. The fish moved closer, still cruising back and forth, and then it stopped, and for a second seemed to lie motionless in the water. The tail dropped beneath the surface, the dorsal fin slid backward and vanished, and the great head reared up, mouth open in a slack, savage grin, eyes black and abysmal. Brody stared in mute horror, sensing this was what it must be like to try to stare down the devil. Come, fish, purred Quint. Come get your supper. He pointed to the harpoon. Suddenly the boat lurched violently. Quint fell back and the harpoon clattered to the deck. The wood under the cleat began to crack, and then the rope snapped backward when slack. God damn it. I never seen a fish do that before. Let's put the cage overboard, said Hooper. You're kidding, said Brody. Hooper went below and reappeared moments later carrying a movie camera in a waterproof housing and a stick with a thong at one end. What are you doing? Brody said. I'm going down there. Maybe that'll bring him out. You're out of your goddamn mind. What are you going to do if he does come out? Well, first, I'm going to take some pictures of him. Then, I'm going to try and kill him. With what, may I ask? This... Hooper held up the stick. Hmm. Good thinking, Quinn said with a derisive cackle. If that doesn't work, you can tickle him to death. What is that? said Brody. Well, it's basically an underwater gun with a 12-gauge shotgun shell. When you get close enough, you jab the fish and the shell goes off. If you hit him right, the brain's the only sure place you kill him. And if you don't? Well, that's what I'm afraid of. I would be too, said Quint. I don't think I'd like 5,000 pounds of pissed-off dinosaur trying to eat me. Well, Quint, you're not having much success, are you? You'll be dead of old age before he comes up. Quint looked at Hooper and said evenly, You telling me my business, boy? No, but I think this fish is more than you can handle. That right, boy. You think you can do better, Quint? Call it that if you want. I think I can kill the fish. Fine and dandy. Go on, Quinn said to Hooper. Get in that thing. Right away, Hooper undressed and pulled on the neoprene suit, then lifted the scuba tank on. Oh, I should have brought some weights, he said. You should have brought some brains, Quint said. Quint and Brody pulled on the ropes and the cage rose in the water. When the hatch broke the surface, Hooper dived overboard through the open hatch and then put his thumb and index finger together in the OK sign. They released the ropes and let the cage descend. Get the rifle, said Quint. He climbed onto the transom and lifted the harpoon to his shoulder. Below, Hooper waited until the bubbly froth of his descent had dissipated. He felt serene. It was the pervasive sense of freedom and ease that he always felt when he dived. He was alone in the blue silence, speckled with shafts of sunlight that danced through the water. The only sounds were those he made, breathing, a deep, hollow noise as he breathed in, a 
a soft thudding of bubbles as he exhaled. Even with the bright sunlight, the visibility in the murky water was poor, no more than 40 feet. Hooper turned slowly around, trying to pierce the edge of gloom. Nothing. He snapped his eyes down again. Rising at him from the darkling blue, slowly, smoothly, was the shark. It rose with no apparent effort, an angel of death gliding towards an appointment foreordained. Hooper stared, enthralled, unable to move. As the fish drew nearer, he marveled at its colors. The flat brown grays seen on the surface had vanished. The top of the immense body was a hard, ferrous gray, bluish, where dappled with streaks of sun. Beneath the lateral line, all was creamy, ghostly white. The fish came closer, silent as a shadow, turned and passed before Hooper's eyes, casually, as if in proud display of its incalculable mass and power. Tentatively, Hooper stuck a hand through the bars and touched the flank. It felt cold and hard, not clammy, but smooth as vinyl. He let his fingertips caress the flesh until he heard faint popping noises, and he saw three straight spirals of angry bubbles speed from the surface, then slow and stop well above the fish. Bullets. Not yet, he told himself. One more pass for pictures. The fish began to turn, banking, the rubbery pectoral fins changing pitch, then rammed through the space between the bars. What the hell is going on down there? said Brody. Why didn't he jab him with the gun? Quint didn't answer. Come up, fish, he said. Come to Quint. Hooper raised his camera and pressed the trigger. He wanted to catch the beast as it emerged from the darkness. Through the viewfinder, he saw the fish turn towards him. It moved fast, tail thrusting vigorously, mouth opening and closing as if gasping for breath. A shiver traveled the length of its body as it closed on the cage. The fish struck the cage, head on the snout ramming between two bars and spreading them. And, knocking Hooper backward, the camera flew from his hands and the mouthpiece shot from his mouth. It's attacking, screamed Brody. He grabbed one of the ropes and pulled, desperately trying to raise the cage. God damn your black soul, Quint shouted. The fish slid backward out of the cage and turned sharply to the right in a tight circle. Hooper reached behind his head, found the tube and the mouthpiece, put it in his mouth, and drew an agonized breath. It was then that he saw the wide gap in the bars and saw the giant head lunging through it. He raised his hands above his head, grasping at the escape hatch. The fish rammed through the space between the bars, spreading them still further with each thrust of its tail. Hooper flattened against the back of the cage, saw the mouth reaching, straining for him. He remembered the gun, and he tried to lower his right arm and grab it. The fish thrust again, and Hooper saw with a terror of doom that the mouth was going to reach him. The jaws closed around his torso. The fish bit down. And the last thing Hooper saw before he died was the eye, gazing at him through a cloud of his own blood. He's got him, cried Brody. Do something. The man is dead, Quinn said. How do you know? We may be able to save him. He is dead. 
Holding Hooper in its mouth, the fish backed out of the cage. It sank a few feet, chewing, swallowing the viscera that were squeezed into its gullet. Then it shuddered and thrust forward with its tail, driving itself and prey upward in the water. He's coming up, said Brody. Grab the rifle. Quint cocked his hand for the throw. The fish broke water 15 feet from the boat, surging upward in a shower of spray. Hooper's body protruded from each side of its mouth, head and arms hanging limply down one side, knees, calves, and feet from the other. In the few seconds while the fish was clear out of the water, Brody thought he saw Hooper's glazed eyes staring open through his face mask, as if in contempt and triumph. The fish hung suspended for an instant, challenging mortal vengeance. Simultaneously, Brody reached for the rifle and Quint cast the harpoon, but the iron went high. For another instant, the fish remained on the surface, its head out of the water. Shoot! yelled Quint. For Christ's sake, shoot! Brody shot without aiming. The first two shots hit the water. The third, to Brody's horror, struck Hooper. The fish began to slip beneath the surface. Bullets plopped harmlessly into the swirl where the head had been. The fish might never have been there. There was no noise, save the whisper of a breeze. The water was calm. The only difference was that Hooper was gone. What do we do now? said Brody. What in the name of God do we do now? This fish is too much for us. It's not real. Not natural. Are you a beaten man? I'm beaten. All we can do is wait till God or nature or whatever the hell is doing this to us decides we've had enough. It's out of man's hands. Not mine. I'm going to kill that thing, said Quint. His eyes searched the sea, craving another confrontation. I am going to kill that fish. As Quint spoke, Brody looked into his eyes. They seemed as dark and bottomless as the eye of the fish. I don't guess I have any choice. No, said Quint. We have no choice. Brody gazed towards the shore. In the growing light, he could see the water tower, a black point rising from the gray strip of land. Quint went to the stern and lifted the bucket of chum onto the transom. We can't be more than a couple of miles offshore, said Brody. I got a feeling, said Quint. Start chumming. He handed Brody the ladle while he unlashed two barrels and carried them and their coils of ropes and harpoon darts back to the stern. Now let's see how long he takes. The sky had lightened to a full gray daylight, and in ones and twos the lights on the shore flicked off. Brody's arm was growing weary from the dipping and emptying of the ladle. He stood up, stretched. Suddenly. He saw the monstrous head of the fish, not five feet away. So close, he could reach over and touch it with the ladle. Black eyes staring at him, silver gray snout pointing at him. Oh God, Brody said. He was waiting for us. Quint was down the ladder and at the stern in an instant. As he jumped onto the transom, the fish's head slipped back into the water and a second later, 
slammed into the boat. The jaws closed on the wood, and the head shook violently from side to side. Brody grabbed a cleat and held on, unable to look away from the eyes. The boat shuddered and jerked, and then lay still again. Right, said Quint. We've got him now. We've got him? Did you see what he did to the boat? Give it a mighty good shake, didn't he, huh? Quint stood and picked up the harpoon. Come on, you mother. Come and get your due. Brody saw fever in Quint's face. A heat that lit up his dark eyes. An anticipation that strummed the sinews in his neck and whitened his knuckles. The boat shuddered again, and there was a dull, hollow thump. You'll not sink me before I get you. What do you mean, sink us? said Brody. He's trying to chew a hole in the bottom of the damn boat. Come out, you son of a bitch! Quint raised high his harpoon. The dorsal fin and tail surfaced ten yards to the right of the stern and began to move again towards the boat. Here you come, said Quint, cooing. Here you come. He stood, legs spread, left hand on his hip, right hand extended to the sky, grasping the harpoon. When the fish was a few feet from the boat, Quint cast his iron. The harpoon struck the fish in front of the dorsal fin, and the fish hit the boat knocking the stern sideways and sending Quint tumbling backward. A trickle of blood ran down his neck. I got you, he cried. I got you, you miserable prick. The rope attached to the iron dart snaked overboard as the fish sounded. And when it reached the end, the barrel popped off the transom, fell into the water, and vanished. He took it down with him, said Brody. Not for long, said Quint. He'll be back, and we'll throw another into him and another and another until he quits, and then he's ours. Quint's confidence was contagious, and Brody now felt ebullient, relieved. Hell, yeah, he yelled. There he comes, said Quint, pointing. The barrel came to the surface and bobbed in the water. Quint raised the harpoon. He's coming up. The fish broke water a few yards from the boat, like a rocket lifting off. Snout, jaw, and pectoral fins rose straight from the water. You bastard, cried Quint. And he threw a second iron, hitting the fish in the belly, just as the great body began to fall for it. It smacked the water with a thunderous boom, sending a blinding fall of spray over the boat. He's done, said Quint, as the second rope uncoiled and tumbled overboard. The boat lurched once and again. There was a distant sound of crunching. Attack me, will you? said Quint. He ran for it and started the engine, and the boat moved away from the bobbing barrels. Has he done any damage? said Brody. Some. He probably poked a hole in us. Nothing to worry about. We'll pump her out. So that's it then? The fish is as good as dead? Not quite. Look. Following the boat, keeping pace, were the two red wood barrels. Dragged by the great force of the fish, each cut through the water, pushing a wave before it and leaving a wake behind it. He's chasing us, said Brody. Quint nodded. He means to make a fight of it. For the first time, Brody saw a frown of disquiet on Quint's face. It was not fear, nor true alarm, but rather a look of uneasy concern, as if in a game the rules had been changed without warning, or the stakes raised. Have you ever seen a fish do this before? he asked. Not like this. Most times, 
Once you get an iron in them, they stop fighting. The boat was turning this way and that in response to Quint's random turning of the wheel. Always the barrels kept up with them. Fine, said Quint. If it's a fight he wants, it's a fight he'll get. He throttled down to idling speed. He jumped up onto the transom and picked up the harpoon. Excitement returned to his face. Okay, come and get it. The barrels kept coming, plowing through the water 30 yards away, then 25, then 20. Brody saw the flat plane of gray pass along the starboard side of the boat, six feet beneath the surface. He's here, Brody cried, heading forward. Damn, said Quint, standing at the end of the pulpit, harpoon raised. The fish had already passed out of range. 30 yards in front of the boat, it turned. The head grazed out of the water, then dipped back in. The tail, standing like a sail, began to thrash back and forth. Here he comes, said Quint. The fish hit the bow head on with a noise like a muffled explosion. Quint cast Zion. It struck the fish atop the head, over the right eye, and it held fast. The rope fed slowly overboard as the fish backed off. Perfect, said Quint. Got him in the head. There were three barrels in the water now, and they skated across the surface. Then they disappeared. God damn! said Quint. That is no normal fish that can sound with three irons in him and three barrels to hold him up. For three hours they waited, tracking the barrels as they moved ever more slowly on a random path across the surface of the sea. At first they would disappear every ten or fifteen minutes, resurfacing a few dozen yards away. Then, their submergences grew rarer until by 11.30 they were wallowing in the water. The rain had stopped and the sky was an unbroken sheet of gray. What do you think? said Brody. Is he dead? I doubt it. But he may be close enough for us to throw a rope round his tail and drag him till he drowns. At the foot of the gin pole was an electric winch. Quint switched it on, then gunned the engine and slowly moved the boat towards the barrels. When he came alongside them, he reached overboard with a gaff, snagged a rope, and pulled a barrel aboard. He then took a knife from the sheath at his belt and cut the rope, then stabbed the knife into the gunwale. He ran the rope through a pulley to the winch, then took a few turns around the winch and flipped the starter switch. As soon as the slack in the rope was taken up, the boat heeled hard to starboard, dragged down by the weight of the fish. Can that winch handle him? asked Brody. He'll never haul him out of the water, but it'll bring him up to us. The winch was turning slowly humming. The rope quivered under the strain, scattering drops of water on Quint's shirt. Suddenly, the rope started coming too fast. It fouled on the winch, coiling in snarls. The boat snapped upright. Rope break, said Brody. And now Brody saw fear in Quint's face. The son of a bitch is coming up. He dashed to the controls and threw the engine into forward. But it was too late. The fish broke water right beside the boat with a great rushing whoosh of noise. It rose vertically, and in an instant of horror, Brody gasped at the size of the body towering overhead. It blocked out the light. The pectoral fins hovered 
like wings, stiff and straight. And as the fish fell forward, they seemed to be reaching out to Brody. The fish landed on the stern of the boat with a shattering crash, driving the boat beneath the waves. In seconds, Quint and Brody were standing in water up to their hips. The fish lay there, its jaw not three feet from Brody's chest. The body twitched, and in the black eye as big as a baseball, Brody thought he saw his own image reflected. God damn your black soul, screamed Quint. You sunk my boat. A barrel floated into the cockpit, the rope writhing like a gathering of worms. Quint grabbed a harpoon dart at the end of the rope, and with his hand, he plunged it into the soft white belly of the fish. Blood poured from the wound and bathed Quint's hands. The boat was sinking. The fish rolled off the stern and slid beneath the waves. The rope, attached to the dart Quint had stuck into the fish, followed. Suddenly, Quint lost his footing and fell backward into the water. The knife! he cried, lifting his leg above the surface. And Brody saw the rope coiled around Quint's foot. Brody looked back to the starboard gunnel. The knife was there, embedded in the wood. He lunged for it, wrenched it free, and turned back, struggling to run in the deepening water. He could not move fast enough. He watched in helpless terror as Quint, reaching towards him with his grasping fingers, eyes wide and pleading, was pulled slowly down into the dark water. For a moment, there was silence, except for the sucking sound of the boat slipping gradually down. The water was up to Brody's shoulders, and he clung desperately to the gin pole. A seat cushion popped to the surface next to him, and Brody grabbed it. He saw the tail and dorsal fin break the surface twenty yards away. The tail waved once left, once right, and the dorsal fin moved closer. Oh, get away! Get away, damn you! Brody yelled, and the fish kept coming, barely moving, closing in. The barrels and skeins of rope trailed behind. The gin pole went under, and Brody let go of it. The bow rose, and then quickly and soundlessly slid beneath the surface. Brody clutched the cushion as the fish came closer. It was only a few feet away, and Brody could see the conical snout. He screamed and closed his eyes, waiting for an agony he could not imagine. Nothing happened. He opened his eyes. The fish was nearly touching him, only a foot or two away, but it had stopped. And then, as Brody watched, the steel gray body began to recede downward into the gloom. It seemed to fall away, an apparition evanescing into darkness. Brody put his face into the water and opened his eyes. Through the stinging salt water mist, he saw the fish sink in a slow and graceful spiral trailing behind it the body of Quint, his arms out to the sides, head thrown back, mouth open in mute protest. The fish faded from view, but kept from sinking into the deep by the bobbing barrels. It stopped somewhere beyond the reach of light, and Quint's body 
hung, suspended, a shadow twirling slowly in the twilight. Rowdy watched until his lungs ached for air. He raised his head, he cleared his eyes, and sighted in the distance the black point of the water tower. And then he began to kick towards shore. <laughs> <laughs>